Chapter Nine of Slave Planet by Lawrence M. Janifer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. You will not tell me how to run my own division. The words were spaced like steel rivets evenly into the air. Doctor Hanlogan looked around the meeting room. Her face not even defiant, but simply assured. Willis of Labor was the first to recover. It's not that we'd like to interfere, he began. She didn't let him finish. That's a lie. Her voice was not excited. It carried the length of the room and left no echoes. Now, Dr. Hanlogan, Rogier, Metal's chairman and head of the meeting, began. Don't soft-soap me, the old woman snapped. I'm too old for it, and I'm too tough for it. I want to look at some facts, and I want you to look at them, too. She paused, and nobody said a word. I want to start with a simple statement. We're in trouble. That's exactly the point, Willis began in his thin, high voice. It's because we all appreciate that fact that you want to tamper, the old woman said. Precisely. The others were seated around the long, gleaming table of native wood. Dr. Hanlogan stood, her back rigid at one end, facing them all with a cold and knowing eye. But I won't allow tampering in my department. I can't allow it. Rogier took a deep breath. The words came like marshmallows out of his overstuffed body. I would hardly call a request for information tampering, he said. I would, Dr. Hanlogan told him tartly. I've had a very good reason over the years to keep information about my section in my own hands. Rogier's voice became stern. And that is? That is, Dr. Hanlogan said, fools like you. Rogier opened his mouth, but the old woman gave him no chance. People who think psychology is a game, or at any rate, a study that applies only to other people, never to them. People who want to subject others to the disciplines of psychology, but not themselves. As I understand it, Rogier began. You do not understand it, the old woman said flatly. I understand it because I have spent my life learning to do so. You have spent your life learning to understand medals and committees. Doubtless, Dr. Rogier, you understand medals and committees. Her glance swept once more around the table, and she sat down. There was a second of silence before Dward of research spoke up. Behind glassy contact lenses, his eyes were, as always, unreadable. Perhaps Dr. Hanlogan has a point, he said. I know I'd hate to have to lay out my work for the meeting before I had it prepared. I'm sure we can allow a reasonable time for preparation. I'm afraid we can't, Rogier put in, almost apologetically. Of course we can't, the old woman added. First of all, I wasn't asking for time for preparation. I was asking for non-interference. And second... We don't have any time at all. Surely matters aren't that serious, Willis put in. Matters, the old woman said, are a good deal more serious than that. Has anyone but me read the latest reports from the Confederation? I think we all have, Rogier said calmly. Well then, the old woman asked, has anyone except myself understood them? The head turned. The eyes raked the table. Dr. Willis hasn't, or he wouldn't be sounding so hopeful. The rest of you haven't, or you wouldn't be talking about time. Rogier, you haven't, or you'd quit trying to pry and begin trying to prepare. Preparations have begun, Rogier said. It's just for that reason that I want to get some idea of what your division... Preparations, she said. The word was like a curse. There's been a leak, and a bad leak. We may never know where it started. A ship's officer taking medals back, a stowaway, anything. 
It doesn't matter. Anyone with any sense knew there had to be a leak sooner or later. We've taken every possible precaution, Willis said. Exactly, Dr. Hanlon told them. And the leak happened. I take it there's no argument about that, given the figures and reports we now have. There was silence. Very well, she went on. The Confederation is acting just as it always has been obvious they would act, with idealism, stupidity, and a gross lack of what is called common sense. She paused for comment. There was none. Disregarding the fact that they need our shipments, and need them badly, they have begun to turn against us, against what they are pleased to call slavery. Well, Rogier asked, it is slavery, isn't it? What difference do labels make? she asked. In any case, they have turned against us. Public opinion is swinging heavily around, and there isn't much chance of pushing it back the other way. The man in the street is used to freedom. He likes it. He thinks the Alberts ought to be free, too. But if they are, Willis said, the man in the street is going to lose a lot of other things, things dependent on our shipments. I said they were illogical, Dr. Hanlingen told him patiently. Idealism almost always is. Logic has nothing to do with this, as anyone but a fool might know. She got up again and began to walk back and forth along the end of the table. There are still people who are convinced, God knows why, that minds work on logic. Minds do not work on anything resembling logic. The laws on which they do work are only now beginning to be understood and codified. But logic was thrown out the window in the days of Freud. That gentleman was a long time ago. The man in the Confederation Street is going to lose a lot if he insists on freeing the Alberts. He hasn't thought of that yet, and he won't think of it until after it happens. She paused at one end of her walk and put her hands on her hips. That man is suffering from a disease, if putting it that way makes it easier for you to see. The disease is called idealism. Its main symptom is a disregard for consequences in favor of principles. But surely, Willis began. Dr. Willis, you are outdoing yourself, the old woman cut in. You sound as if you are hopeful about idealism resting somewhere even in us. And perhaps it does. Perhaps it does. It is a persistent virus, but I hope we can control its more massive outbreaks, gentlemen and not attempt to convince ourselves that this disease is actually a state of health. She began to pace again. Idealism is a disease, she said. In epidemic proportions, it becomes incurable. Then there is nothing to be done? Dward asked. Dr. Rogier has his preparations, the old woman said. I'm sure they are as efficient as they can be. They are useless, but... He knows that as well as I do. Now, wait up, Rogier began. Against ships of the Confederation, armed with God alone knows what, after better than one hundred years of progress? Don't be silly, Dr. Rogier. Our preparations are better than nothing, perhaps, but not much better. They can't be. Having reached her chair again, she sat down in it. The meeting was silent for better than a minute. Dr. Rogier was the first to speak. "'But don't you see?' he said. "'That's just why we need to know what's going on in your division. Perhaps a weapon might be forged from the armory of psychology, which—' "'Before that metaphor becomes any more mixed,' Dr. Hanlingen said, "'I want to clear one thing up. I am not going to divulge any basic facts about my division, now or ever.' But. I want you to listen to me carefully, she said. The tools of psychology are both subtle and simple. Anyone can use a few of them. And anyone, in possession of only those few, will be tempted to put them to use. That use is dangerous, more dangerous than a ticking bomb. 
I will not run the risk of such danger. Surely we are all responsible men, Rogier began. Given enough temptation, Dr. Hanlogen said, there is no such thing as a responsible man. If there were, none of us would be here on Freuling's world. None of us would be masters, and none of the Alberts slaves. I'll give you an example, she said after a little time. The psych division has parties, parties which are rather well known among other divisions. The parties involve drinking and promiscuous sex. They get rather wild, but there is no great harm done by these activities. Indeed, they provide a useful, perhaps a necessary release. She paused. Therefore, I have forbidden them. Willis said, What? The others waited. I have forbidden them, she said, but I have not stopped them, nor will I. The fact that they are forbidden adds a certain spice to the parties themselves. My discovery of one of them does shake the participants up a trifle, but this is a minor damage. More important, it keeps alive the idea of forbidden fruit. The parties are extremely popular. They are extremely useful. Were I to permit them, they would soon be neither popular nor useful. I'm afraid I don't quite see that. Duard put in. Dr. Hanlogen nodded. For the first time, she put her arms on the table and leaned a little forward. Many of the workers here, she said, are infected by the disease of idealism. The notion of slavery bothers them. They need to rebel against the establishment in order to make that protest real to them, and in order to release hostility which might otherwise destroy us from the inside. In my own division, this has been solved simply by creating a situation in which the workers fear me. Fear being a compound of love or awe and hatred. This, however, will not do on a scale larger than one division. A dictatorship complex is set up, against which rebellion may still take place. Therefore are the parties. They serve as a harmless relief for rebellious spirits. The parties are forbidden. Those who attend them are flouting authority. Their tension fades. They become good workers for us, instead of idealistic souls against us. Interesting, Rogier said. May we take it that this is a sample of the work you have been doing? You may, the old woman said flatly. And about the current crisis, your suggestions? My suggestion, gentlemen, is simple, Dr. Hanlogen said. I can see nothing except an act of God which is going to stop the current Confederation movement against us. The leak has occurred. We are done for if it affects government policy. My suggestion, gentlemen, is just this. Pray. Unbelievingly, Willis echoed, Pray? To whatever God you believe in, gentlemen. Dr. Hanlogen said, to whatever God permits you to remain masters on a slave world. Pray to him, because nothing less than a God is going to stop the Confederation from attacking this planet. Public Opinion 2 Being an excerpt from a conversation between Mrs. Felicia Gordon, citizen, white female, age 38, occupation housewife, Residence 70145 West 305th Street, New York, USA, Earth. And Mrs. Gwen Brandon, citizen, oriental female, age 36, occupation housewife. Residence 70121 West 313th Street, New York, USA, Earth. On a mini-mart bench, midway between the two homes, in the year of the Confederation, 210, on May 16th, afternoon. Mrs. Gordon. They've all been talking about it. How those poor things have to work and work until they drop, and they don't even get paid for it or anything. Mrs. Brandon. What do you mean, don't get paid? Of course they get paid. 
You have to get paid when you work, don't you? Mrs. Gordon. Not those poor things. They're slaves. Mrs. Brandon. Slaves? Like in the olden times? Mrs. G. That's what they say. Everybody's talking about it. Mrs. B. Well, why don't they do something about it, then? The ones that are like that. I mean, there's always something you can do. Mrs. G. They're just being forced to work until they absolutely drop, is what I hear. And all for a bunch of people who just lord it over them with guns and everything. You see, these beings, they're green, not like us. But they have feelings, too. Mrs. B. Of course they do, Felicia. Mrs. G. Well, they don't have much education, hardly knowing anything. So when people with guns come in, you see, there just isn't anything they can do about it. Mrs. B. Why are they let, then? Mrs. G. Who, the people with guns? Well, nobody lets them. Not just like that. It's just like we only found out about it now. Mrs. B. I didn't hear a word on the news. Mrs. G. You listen tonight, and you'll hear a word, Gwen, dear. Mrs. B. Oh, my. That sounds like there's something up. Now, what have you been doing? Mrs. G. Don't you think it's right for these poor beings? I mean, no pay and nothing at all but work, work, work until they absolutely drop? Mrs. B. What have you been doing? I mean, what can any one person do? Of course it's terrible and all that, but... Mrs. G. We talked it over. I mean, the group I belong to, you know. On Wednesday, because all of us had heard something about it, you see, and so we brought it up and discussed it. And it's absolutely true. Mrs. B. How can you be sure of a thing like that? Mrs. G. We found out. Mrs. B. When it isn't even on the news or anything? Mrs. G. We found out that people have been talking from other places, too. Downtown and even in the suburbs. Mrs. B. Oh, then it must be. But what can you do after all? It's not as if we were in the government or anything. Mrs. G. Don't you worry about that. There's something you can do, and it's not hard, either. And it has an effect, a definite effect, they say. Mrs. B. You mean collecting money to send them? Mrs. G. Money won't do them any good. No. What we need is the government to do something about this. Mrs. B. It's easy to talk. Mrs. G. And we can get the government to do something, too, if there are enough of us. And there will be. Mrs. B. I should think that anybody who hears about these people, Felicia. Mrs. G. Well, they're not people, exactly. Mrs. B. What difference does that make? They need help, don't they? And we can give them help, if you really have an idea. Mrs. G. We discussed it all, and we've been writing letters. Mrs. B. Letters? Just letters? Mrs. G. If a senator gets enough letters, he has to do something, doesn't he? Because the letters are from the people who vote for him, you see? Mrs. B. But that means a lot of letters. Mrs. G. We've had everybody sending postcards. Fifteen or twenty each. That mounts up awful fast, Gwen, dear. Mrs. B. But just postcards? Mrs. G. And telephone calls, where that's possible, and visits, and starting even more talk everywhere, just everywhere. Mrs. B. Do you really think it's going to work? I mean, it seems like so little. Mrs. G. It's going to work. It's got to. Mrs. B. What are they working at? I mean, the, the slaves. Mrs. G. They're being forced, Gwen, dear, absolutely forced to work. Mrs. B. Yes, dear, but what at? What do they do? 
Mrs. G. I don't see where that makes any difference. Actually, nobody has been very clear on the details. But the details don't matter, do they, Gwen, dear? The important thing is, we have to do something. Mrs. B. You're right, Felicia, and I'll... Mrs. G. Of course I'm right. Mrs. B. I'll start right in with the postcards. A lot of them. Mrs. G. And don't forget to tell other people. As many as you can manage. We need all the help we can get. And so do the slaves. End of chapter 9「Chapter Ten of Slave Planet by Lawrence M. Jennifer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The days passed, and the training went on, boring and repetitious, as each man tried to hammer into the obdurate head of an Albert just enough about his own particular section of machinery so that he could run it capably and call for help in case of emergencies. And, though every man on Freuling's world disliked every moment of the job, the job was necessary and went on. Though they too were slaves to a great master, none thought of rebelling, for the name of the master was necessity, and economic law, and from that rule there are no rebels. The days passed evenly, and the work went slowly on. And then the training was finished. The new Alberts went on a daily work schedule, supervised only by the spy sets and an occasional, deliberately random visit from a master. The visits were necessary, too. The Alberts had not the sophistication to react to a spy set, and personal supervision was needed to convince them they were still being watched. They still had to work. A master came. A master saw them working. That they could understand that and the punishments these went under the name of discipline and had three grades the belbus beam administered all three by means of a slight readjustment in the ray it was angled as widely as possible and the dispersed beam carefully controlled acted directly on the nervous system cadnan troubled by marvis threats and by his own continuing thoughts of dara was a trifle absent-minded and a little slower than standard. He drew punishment twice, both times in the first grade only. Albin administered both punishments, explaining to his partner Derbis that he didn't mind doing it, and besides, someone had to. Sometimes Dodd thought of Albin giving out discipline, and of all his life on Froiling's world, in terms of a sign he had once seen. It had been a joke, he remembered that clearly. But it was no more a joke now than the words which Flash nearly ignored at the back of his mind. Once or twice he had imagined this new sign hanging luridly over the entire planet, posted there in the name of profit, in the name of necessity, in the name of economic law. Everything, not compulsory, is forbidden. The Alberts had to be trained. The Alberts had to be disciplined. The men had to work with them. The men were forbidden to leave the planet. And who were the slaves? That, Dodd told himself cloudily, was far from an easy decision. Everything not compulsory was forbidden. Even the parties were forbidden, though it was always possible to find one. Dodd had avoided them completely, afraid now of another breakdown, this time in public. He had not seen Greta or called her, though he had her number now. He had stayed alone as much as possible. He had no idea what had happened to him, and that added to his fright and to his fear of a recurrence. But Albin, he knew, was having his fun, and so were others. The older men, it seemed, devoted themselves to running the place, to raising their families and giving good advice to keeping production up and cost down. The younger men had fun. Dodd had thought of marriage. Now it was no more than a memory, a hope he might once have had. Now the end had come. There was no marriage. There was no life. Only the idea of hope remained. He had never had the vestige of a real female image in his mind. 
Sometimes he had told himself to be more outgoing, to meet more women. But then how did a man meet women? He had fun. And Dodd never enjoyed that particular brand of fun, Albin's brand. There was a social, an acceptable party that would get him into no trouble, in Building One. Dodd felt like lying down and letting the day drain out of him into the comforting mattress there in his room. He felt like relaxing in his own company, and that, he saw suddenly, was going to mean drinking. He could see the future unroll before him. He could see the first drink and the tenth, because drink was an escape, and he needed some escape from the world he was pledged to uphold, the world of slavery. He could not afford to drink again. So naturally, he was getting ready to go to the social. Albin would be there, undoubtedly. Some of the older men would be there, and a scattering of women would be there, too. He remembered himself thinking long ago, before such a party, tonight might be the night. He shaved very carefully, faithful to memory, dressed in the best he could find in his closet, and went out, heading for the elevator. Tonight might be the night, but it made no difference, not any longer. The trip to sub-basement took a few whooshing seconds. He stepped out into a lighted, oil-smelling underground corridor, took a deep breath, and headed off through gleaming passages toward another elevator at the far end. Before he reached it, he took a turning, and then another. After a magnificently confusing trip through an unmarked labyrinth, he found the elevator that led him up into the right section of Building One. That was no special feat, of course. People had been doing the like ever since the first housing project days, on pre-Confederation Earth. Dodd never gave it a second thought. His mind was busy. The phrase had floated to the forefront of his brain again, right behind his eyes, lighting up with a regularity that was almost soothing, almost reassuring. This is the end. This is the end. This is the end. When the elevator door slid open, he was grim-faced, withdrawn, and he stepped out like a threat into a cheerful, brightly dressed crowd of people. Here he is, someone shouted. I told you he'd be here. I told you. Dodd turned, but the words weren't meant for him. Down the corridor, a knot of men and women were surrounding a new arrival from somewhere else, laughing and talking. As he stepped forward, his eyes still on that celebration, a pathway opened up for him. He was in sober black, and he went through the corridor like a pencil marked down paper, leaving an open trail as he passed. A girl stopped him before he reached the door of the party room. She stepped directly into his path, and he saw her, and his expression began to change, a little at a time so that his eyes were, for long seconds, happier than his face, and he looked like a young bull terrier having a birthday party. "'Am I in your way?' the girl said, without budging an inch. She was dressed in a bright green material that seemed to fade so near the glowing happiness of her face. Her hair was brown, a quite ordinary brown, and even in that first second Dodd noticed her hands. They were long and slim, the thumbs pointed outward, and they were clasped at her breast in a pose that should have been mocking, but was only pleasant. He couldn't think of anything to say. Finally, he settled on, My name's Dodd, as the simplest and quickest way of breaking the ice that surrounded him. Very well, then, Mr. Dodd, the girl said. She wouldn't go along with polite forms. Am I in your way? Because if I am, I am terribly sorry. You're not in my way at all, Dodd said heavily. I just didn't notice you. And that was a lie. But there was nothing else to say. The thousands of words that arranged themselves so neatly into patterns when he was alone had sunk to the very bottom of his suddenly leaden mind, almost burying a flashing sign. He felt as if he were growing extra fingers and ears. I noticed you, the girl said, and I said to myself, I said, 
What can a person as grim as all that be doing at a social as gay as all this? So I stopped you to see if I could find out. Dodd licked his lips. I don't know, he said. I thought maybe I'd meet somebody. I just thought I'd like to come. Well, the girl said, you've met somebody, and now what? Dodd found some words. Not many, but enough. I haven't met you yet, he said, in what he hoped was a bright tone. What's your name? The girl smiled, and Dodd saw for the first time that she hadn't been smiling before. Her face, in repose, was light enough and to spare. When she smiled, he wanted smoked glasses. "'Very well,' she said. "'My name is Fredericks, Norma Fredericks. And yours is—' "'Dodd,' he said. "'John Dodd. They call me Johnny.' "'All right, John,' she said. "'You haven't been to many socials, have you? Because I'd have seen you. I'm at every one I can find time for.' You'd be surprised how many that is. Or maybe you wouldn't. There was no answer to the last half of that. So Dodd backtracked, feeling a shocking relief that she hadn't been to the party at all which he and the other girl, whose name he could very suddenly no longer remember, had made fools of themselves. He gave her an answer to the first half of her question. I haven't been to many socials, no, he said. I... He shrugged and felt mountainous next to her. "'I stay by myself, mostly,' he said. "'And now you want to meet people,' Norma said. "'All right, Johnny Dodd, you're going to meet people.' She took him by the arm and half-led, half-dragged him to the door of the party room. Inside, the noise was like a blast of heat, and Dodd stepped involuntarily back. "'Now that's no way to be.' Norma said cheerfully, and piloted him somehow inside, past a screaming crew of men and women with disposable glasses in their hands, past an oblivious couple, two couples, four, seven, past mountains and masses of color and noise and drink and singing, horribly off-key, not bothersome at all, loud and raucous and somehow, Dodd thought wildly, entirely fitting. This was Norma's element, he told himself, and allowed her to escort him to a far corner of the room, where she sat him down in a chair, said, Don't go away, don't move, and disappeared. Dodd sat stock still while the noise washed over him. People drifted by, but nobody so much as looked in his direction, and he saw neither Alban nor that other forgettable girl for all of which he was profoundly grateful. He hadn't been to a social since his last mistake, and before that it had been almost two years, he realized with wonder. He'd forgotten just how much of everything it could be. He devoted a couple of minutes to catching his breath, and then he just watched people, drifting, standing, forming new combinations every second. He thought once he saw Albin in the middle of a crowd near the door, but he told himself he was probably mistaken. There was no one else he recognized. He didn't grow tired, but sitting and watching, he found, was exhilarating enough. In another minute, he was sure Norma wasn't going to come back. Probably she had found someone else, he told himself, in what he thought was a reasonable manner. After all, he wasn't a very exciting person. She had probably started off to get him a drink or something, with the best of intentions, and met someone more interesting on the way. He had just decided that, after all, he couldn't really blame her, when she appeared at his side. The punch, she announced, is authentic. It is totally authentic. One glass and you forget everything. Two and you remember. Three... I don't know what happens with the third glass yet, but I'm going to find out. He looked at her hands. She was holding two disposable glasses full of purple liquid. He took one from her and got up. Well, he said, cheers. Also, down the hatch, she said, and any other last year's slang you happen to have around and want to get rid of. She lifted the glass. 
Here's to you, John Dodd, she said, and tipped the glass at her lips. Just that. He had never before seen anyone drink in just that way, or drink so quickly. In seconds, before he had taken a sip, he was so amazed watching her. The glass was empty. Whoosh, she said clearly. That ought to hold me for at least six minutes. Then she noticed that he hadn't started his own drink yet, so he took a cautious sip. It tasted like grape juice, like wine, like... He couldn't identify the ingredients, and besides, he was watching her face. He took another sip. That's the way, Norma approved. Soon you'll be drinking with the big boys. And whether she was making fun of him or not hardly mattered. He felt careless. Maybe the drink had done it. Why did you pick me? He heard himself say. Why did you stop me out of all those people? She hesitated, and when she spoke it sounded like the truth, perhaps too much like the truth to be true. You looked like a puppy, she said seriously, like a puppy trying to act fierce. Maybe I've always had a weakness for dumb animals. No offense meant, John Dodd. The idea of being offended hadn't occurred to him. But he tried it out experimentally and discovered he didn't like it. Before he could say anything, though, Norma had become energetic again. Enough analysis, she said abruptly, so strongly that he wasn't sure what she meant by the words. Sit down, sit down. He felt for the chair behind him and sat. Norma cast a keen eye over the nearby crowds, spotted an empty chair, and went off for it. Later, she told him, when she had placed herself next to him, we can join the crowd. For now, let's get, let's get better acquainted, Johnny. That's the first time you've called me Johnny, he said. So it is, she said. Her face was a mask, and then it lightened. What do you work at, Johnny? I'm in building three, he said. It was easier to answer her than anatomize the confusions he felt. I work with smelting and quality control, you know. He took another sip of his drink and found to his surprise that it was more than half gone. With the Alberts, she said. I know. He thought he read her look correctly. I don't like it either, he told her earnestly. But somebody has to do it. I think... You don't have to get defensive. Norma said. Relax. Enjoy yourself. Join the party. Did I look at you as if you were a murderer of small children? I just don't like it, he said carefully. I... Well, there isn't anything I can do about it, is there? I wouldn't know, she said. And then, had she made a decision? He couldn't tell. She went on. I'm in psych myself. Psych? You? Psych me, she said, so I'm every bit as responsible as you are, and maybe the reason there's nothing to do is because it's already been done. Already been done? Dodd swallowed the rest of his drink in one gulp and leaned toward her. Norma looked down at her own empty glass. There were rumors, she said. Frankly, I'd rather they didn't get around, and if I hadn't had too much to drink or something, I wouldn't even be mentioning them. I'm sorry. No, he said, surprising himself. Tell me, what rumors? Norma kept her eyes on her glass. Nothing, she said in a new, strained voice. Dodd remained in the same position, feeling more tense than he could ever remember having felt. Tell me, he said. Come on, if you've gone this far... I suppose I have, she said. I suppose I've gone too far now, haven't I? You've got to tell me. Yes, she said. It's... They say the Confederation knows. I mean, knows what we're doing here. Officially. Everything. She dropped the glass then, and Dodd stooped ridiculously to pick it up. It lay between the chairs. He felt the blood rushing to his head. There was pounding in his temples. He got the glass and gave it to her, but she took it absently, as if she hardly noticed it. 
Of course, it's just a rumor, she said in a low voice. The people know, Dodd said. It's out. It's all out. About the slavery. Is that what you mean? She nodded. I'm sorry. But it's important, he began, and stopped. He looked at his glass, still empty. He took a breath, began again. I work with them. I'm part of it. It's important to me. Just as important to me, Norma said. Believe me, Johnny, I'm responsible too. But you're in psych, he said. That's morale. Nothing more than morale, as far as I know. She raised her head and looked him full in the face, her eyes like a bright challenge. Her face was quite sober when she spoke. I'm in psych, but it's more than morale, Johnny. We're always thinking up new ways to keep the little Alberts in their place. Put it that way. Though nobody's really come up with an improvement on the original notion. The original notion? Now her smile gave light and no heat. A freak of nature. The original specific, she said. She paused for a second and the mockery in her voice grew more broad. That old-time religion, she said drawing the words out like fine, hot wire. That old-time religion, Johnny Dodd. End of chapter 10Days passed, and he began to improve slightly. He received no further discipline, and he was beginning to settle into a routine. Only thoughts of Dara disturbed him. Those, and the presence of Marver, who was still apparently waiting to make good his incomprehensible threat. Marver had said he was going to leave, but he still appeared every evening in the same room. Cadnan had hardly dared to question him for fear of being drawn into the plan, whatever it was. He could only wait and watch and wish for someone to talk to. But, of course, there was no one. And then, one day, during the first part of his working shift, a master came into the room, the very master who had gone with Cadnan through his training. "'You're Cadnan?' he asked. Cadnan said, "'I am Cadnan.' The master beckoned through the open door of Cadnan's working room, and two more masters appeared, strange ones, leading between them an elder. The elder, Cadnan saw at once, had lived through many matings. The green skin of his arms was turning to silver, and his eye was no longer bright, but dulling fast with age. He looked at the working room and at the young Albert with blank caution. This one is called Gornum, the master said. He'll be with you when you work. He's going to help you work. Well, you can teach him all he has to know. Just make sure you don't let him handle the buttons until we give you the word. All right? Cadnan understood. All right, he said, and the three masters left the room without more words. The door shut behind them, and Gornum visibly relaxed. Yet there was still wariness behind the old eye. I work in the field, he said after a second. I am good worker in the field. Cadnan knew from gossip about the field. That was the place where the metal lay. Alberts worked there, digging it up and bringing it to the buildings where Cadnan and many like him took over the job. He nodded slowly, bending his body from the waist instead of from the neck like the masters or Marver. If you are in the field, he said, why do you come here? This is not a place for diggers. I am brought here, Gornum said. I am an elder many times. What the masters say, I do. Now they say I come here, and I come. Cadnan looked doubtful. You ought to work with me. So the masters say. That was unanswerable, and Cadnan accepted it. He flicked a glance at the TV screen, which showed him the smelting process, and leaped for the buttons. After a few minutes of action, he was finished. There was a slight breathing space. "'I am to tell you what to do,' he said. Gornum looked grave. 
I see what it is you do, he said. It is a lesson. When you act for the masters, the great machines obey you. It is true, Cadnan said. This is the lesson, Gornum said slowly, as if it were truly important. We are shown the machines so that we may learn to be like the machines. When the master tells us what to do, we are to do it. There is nothing else. Cadnan thought about that. It made sense. It made a structure he could understand, and it made the world a less confusing place. You have said a truth, he judged at last. It is one of many truths, Gornum said. And that was an invitation, Cadnan recognized. He hesitated no more than a second. Where may I learn the others? But Gornum didn't answer, and Cadnan's breathing space was over. He had to be back at the board, pushing buttons, watching carefully. Gornum stood behind him, peering over his shoulder with a cloudy eye. Neither said a word until the new spell of work was over. Then Cadnan repeated his question. It is not for all, Gornum said distantly. One must be chosen. You have come to me, Cadnan said. You have been sent to me. Is this what you call chosen? It was the right answer, perhaps the only right answer. Gornum pretended to consider the matter for a minute, but his mind was already made up. We are above you, on the floor over yours, he said. When our work is finished, I will take you there. Cadnan imagined a parade of new truths, a store of knowledge that would lay all his questions to rest and leave him, as after a meal, entirely satisfied. He went back to work and contemplated the first of the truths. He was to be like the machine. He promised himself he would try to imitate the machine, doing only what the masters ordered, and for the rest of that day... Indeed, life seemed to make perfect calming sense. But, after all, Gornum was only an elder, and not a master. He could be wrong. The doubt appeared at the end of the day, but by then Gornum had the younger Albert in tow. They took the elevator up one flight and went to Gornum's room. The novelty of all this excited Cadman so that he nearly forgot his new doubts. They shrank perceptibly, without disappearing altogether. Gornum opened the door of the new room. Inside, Cadnan saw six elders sitting in a circle on the floor. The circle, incomplete, was open toward the door, and all six big eyes were staring at the newcomers. The floor was nearly bare. The leaves had been brushed into mounds that lay in the corners. Without a word, Gornum sat in the circle, and motioned Cadnan to a place beside him. Moving slowly and uncertainly, Cadnan came forward and sat down. There was a second of absolute silence. One of the other elders said, You bring a new one to us? I bring a new one, Gornum said. The other elder, leaning forward from the waist, peered at Cadnan. His eye was larger than normal, and glittering cold. Cadnan, awestruck, neither spoke nor moved, and the elder regarded him for a time, and then said abruptly, "'Not all are called to the truth.' "'He has been called,' Gornum said. "'He has been chosen.' "'How is he chosen?' Gornum explained. When he had finished, a silence thick as velvet descended upon the room. Then, very suddenly, all the elders spoke at once. May the masters live forever. Cadnan, by this time, was nearly paralyzed with fright. He sat very still. The elders continued in a slow, leaden chorus. May the masters live forever. May the words live forever. May the lessons live forever. May the truths live forever. Then the velvet silence came down again, but the words rang through it faintly until Gornum broke the spell with speech. The young one has come to learn. He has come to know the truths. He looked around at the others and then went on. His name is Cadnan. 
He wishes to have your names. Let him have your names. The elder, who had spoken first, identified himself as Lonak. The others gave their names in order. Dalor, Puna, Grudak, Burlog, Mantun. Cadden stared with fascinated eyes at Puna, who was older than anyone he had ever seen. His skin was nearly all white, and in the dim room it seemed to have a faint shine. His voice was very high and thin, like a wind sighing in tall tree branches. Cadnan shivered, but didn't take his eye from Puna, until, as if at a signal, all the elders rose. Awkwardly then, Cadnan rose with them, again confused and still frightened. He saw Gornum raise his hands over his head and chant, "'Tall are the masters!' All the others repeated the words. "'Wise are the masters!' Cadnan this time repeated the phrase with the elders. "'Good are the masters!' When the antiphon had been delivered, Gornum waited a full second and then fell prostrate to the floor. The others followed his example except for Cadnan, who, afraid to let himself fall on bare metal, crouched down slowly instead. "'Weak are the slaves!' Gornum whispered. The answer was a whisper, too. "'Small are, are the slaves!' slaves. the others whispered. "'They are like small ones all the days of their lives, and only the masters are elders. "'The, the masters, masters are, are elders!' elders. As the machine obeys, Gornum said, so the slave obeys. As the tree obeys, so the slave obeys. As the metal obeys, so the slave obeys. As the ground obeys, so the slave obeys. So the slave obeys. Then there was silence again not as profound as before. Through it, Cadden could hear the others whispering, but he couldn't quite catch their words. He was later told what praying was, though he never had a chance to practice it. And then everyone returned to the original circle and squatted. In what was almost a normal tone, Gornum said, Here is our new one. He must be told. Puna himself rose. I will tell him. And Cadnan, frightened by the very look of the elder, could do nothing but follow him as he beckoned and went to a corner near a mound of leaves. The others, scattered, were eating. Cadnan picked up a leaf, but Puna took it gently out of his hand. We do not eat until it is over, he said quietly. Cadnan accepted this without words and Puna told him the legend. During the entire tale, Cadnan, stock still, didn't even think of interrupting. At first his attention wandered to the leaves, but as Puna's voice went on he listened more and more closely, and even his fright began to leave him under the legend's fascination. Long ago the masters come to the world, sent by the great elder. We are no more than children. We do not work. We do nothing except eat and sleep and live out our lives in the world. The great elder makes us the gift of talking and the gift of trees, and he makes the rules of the trees. Then he does nothing more for us. First we must become more than children, more than small ones. For this he sends the masters. The masters are good, because they show us work and give us machines that have power. Our power is over the masters because of the machines. But we may not use such power. They are elder to us. They are wiser than we are. Only when we become so wise, we use power against them. And in that day, master and slave are one. In that day, the great elder returns to his small ones. In this time, there is the work, 
and the work makes us always more like the masters. We live in the buildings, like masters. We work with machines, like masters. We do what the masters say. Soon we are all the same. No one can tell when we are like masters in all things. We know of it when the great elder returns to us. All must watch and wait for that day. In this time, we only remember and tell ourselves the truths over and over. There are many truths, and some I cannot speak. Here are the others. The masters are our elders. The machines are under obedience to us while we obey the masters. The great elder wishes our obedience to the masters. If we disobey the masters, the machines and the trees will not obey us, and there will be no more work, and no small ones. For this is the order of the world, some obeying and some to be obeyed. It is visible and plain. When the chain is broken, all the chain breaks. Puna paused and then repeated the last sentence. When the chain is broken, all the chain breaks. It is true, Cadnan said excitedly. It is true. Yet there is more truth. There is, Puna said soberly. We meet again in five days' time. I can count five days, and so the others will know, and you will know. At this next meeting you will be told more truths. His smile was thin and distant. Now eat. Cadnan reached numbly for a leaf, and, without thinking, began to nibble. The world had been set in order. He had no more questions now. Instead, he felt empty spaces, waiting to be filled with the great knowledge of Puna and of Gornum and all the others at the next meeting, and at other meetings after that. He put that thought away. It was too much and too large. The one certain thing was that in five days' time, whenever that was, he would know more. In five days they would all meet again. He hoped five days was not that long. As matters turned out, of course, he need not have worried. The meeting he was waiting for never happened. And, after that, there were no more meetings at all. Public Opinion 3 Being excerpts from memo directives sent between executives of Associated Metallic Products, Limited, a corporation having its main offices within Dome 2, Luna City, Luna, and associated offices on all three inhabited planets. The memo directives being dated between May 14th and May 21st, in the year of the Confederation, 210. To John Harrison, from Frederick Ramsbotham. Re. Metals, Supplies, and Shipment. It having come to my attention that the process of metal shipment is in danger because of a threat to the materials and procurement divisions of AMP Limited, I wish to advise you, as current chairman of the board, of the nature of the emergency, and request your aid in drawing up plans to deal with it. According to reports from our outside operatives, and such statistical checking as we have been able to use in a matter of this nature, there exists a strong possibility that present procurement procedures regarding our raw materials may at any moment be abrogated by act of the Confederation government. The original motive for this action would seem to be a rising tide of public unrest, sparked apparently by chance disclosure of our procurement procedures. That the public unrest may very soon reach the point at which Confederation notice, and hence, Confederation action may be taken, is the best judgment both of our outside operatives and of our statistical department. In order to deal with this unprecedented emergency, it would be advisable to have your thoughts on the matter. With these in hand, to Fred Ramsbotham, from John Harrison, re 
Your Memo, May 14th. My God, Fred, I haven't seen such a collection of verbiage since Latin class. Why not say what you mean? People are calling the setup on Freuling's world slavery, and slavery is a nasty word. Let's get together for a talk. And what's with the high-sounding guff? You sound sore about something. What? 2. James Oliver Gogarty From Leonard Offutt Re. Statistical Findings The situation is serious, J.O., and there's no getting around it. If the government has to take action, there's only one way, given current majorities, they're going to be able to move, and that's to declare Froehling's world a protectorate, or some such. Get your lawyers to straighten out the terminology. In plain and simple English, a ward of the state. And administer the place for the best interests of the natives. Get that, the natives. Never mind us. Never mind AMP. Never mind the medals we need. No, the government will step in and take all that away from us in the interests of a bunch of silly, green-looking monsters who can barely talk and can't, as near as I can see, think at all. Statistics don't give us much of a chance of heading them off. As a matter of fact, any recommended course of action has better than a 50% chance of making matters even worse. And if you don't think they can be worse, take a look at the attached sheet, which... 2. John Harrison From Frederick Ramsbotham Re. Your Memo, May 15th have you never heard of the Confederation impounding records, or those memos, for instance? 2. Fred Ramsbotham From John Harrison Re. Your Memo, May 15th Have you never heard of AMP burning them, you silly damn fool? Now let's get together for a talk. 2. James Oliver Gogarty From Gregory Whiting and Staff. Re. Your Memo, May 17th. Pressure put on Confederation executives and members of the Senate might convince the Confederation that, without a fight, Freling's world would not surrender to Confederation control. It might not be advisable to begin such a fight. Even with modern methods of transport and training, the weapons gap between the Confederation and Freling's world is a severe handicap. In other words, J.O., if it came to a showdown, the people here don't think we stand a fair chance of coming out on top. You'd better rethink your position, then. 2. James Oliver Gogarty from John Harrison Re. Freuling's World Interoffice Guff says you're planning definite moves on your own, J.O., and against some opposition. I'm still chairman of the board around here, and I intend to use power if I have to. The best advice I can get tells me your plans are unadvisable. Get it through your head that this has nothing to do with the board elections. This is a serious matter. I can stop you, J.O., and don't think I won't if it comes to that, but I don't want to make threats. There must be something we can do but we're going to have to devote more thought to the whole matter first. 2. James Oliver Gogarty From Leonard Offutt Re. Statistical Findings Chances of such pressure succeeding are, according to derived figures, 37%. Chances of the pressure leading to actual attack on Froiling's world, see attached sheet, are 58%. We cannot advise... 2. Frederick Ramsbotham From James Oliver Gogarty Re. Attached Statistical Findings Of course it's a risk, Frederick, but we're in the risk-taking business, and we always were, as your father used to say, and mine too. Between us, John is a cautious old man, and the rest of the board is beginning to appreciate that. By next year, the entire situation may have changed. I'm asking for your support, then, as a matter of practical politics. 
In a risky matter like this one, support can make all the difference between... To James Oliver Gogarty from John Harrison Re, my memo, May 19th J.O., I mean it. Now lay off. To Williston Reed from John Harrison Re, current memo series As you know, I'm keeping you up to date whenever I have a minute between appointments. A publicity chief ought to know everything inside as well as public issue material, if only so he can be conscious of what to hide. I've tried to work with you as well as I can, and if there are delays in reporting, you'll understand that pressure of other duties... The story behind all of this is simple enough. The takeover Gogarty and Ramsbotham have been trying to pull is interfering with practical business. Frankly, AMP's competitors are happy enough to jump in and stir the pot. I think they've been buying up senators here and there, for which there is, God knows, enough precedent. The entire Senate hasn't been bought since the Dedrick mutiny forty years back, but you don't need the entire Senate if you have a few key men, and I've always thought Dedrick's lawyers were wasteful. And beyond what the competition's been active in, there are always the fanatics. Freedom for all, you know the sort of thing. Now, the big danger is that if R and G succeed in keeping things messed up, the rest of the medals boys will step in, push the government into the right moves, and kill Froehling's world deader than Dedrick himself. Which, according to the statistical breakdown, won't put us into the bankruptcy courts, but will slide us from a first or second spot to a ninth or tenth one. The big question is whether you'd rather be a small frog in a big puddle, or the reverse. Me, I'd rather be a big frog in a big puddle than any other combination I could think of. And, in spite of everything, I think I'm going to go on being just that. Freuling's world has been around for a long time, but the current AMP fight gives the competition the opportunity they need, and they're pushing it. If we can weather the storm, well, I'm being gloomy. Of course we can weather the storm. I'll swing Gogarty back, and that will leave Ramsbotham nowhere to go. To John Harrison From Frederick Ramsbotham Re. Freuling's World Support of the suggestion put forward by Mr. Gogarty at the last board meeting was not, believe me, given without grave consideration. Now that the matter has been decided, I hope we can all pull together like teammates and let the dead past bury its dead. I'm sure that... To Fred Ramsbotham, from John Harrison, Re, your memo, May 21st. I'm worrying a little more about burying some of the currently living, our own men on Freuling's world. I've got to ask you to reconsider. 2. All new services for immediate release. From Williston Reed. As almost his first act on taking his position as chairman of the board of Associated Metallic Products Limited, Frederick Ramsbotham today issued a statement of policy regarding interference by Confederation governmental officials in what he termed the private business of AMP. Mr. Ramsbotham, whose recent election came as a surprise to many shareholders, has stated his intention of remaining firm in continuance of present policies, regardless of what he described as threats from Confederation officials. He states that his duty to shareholders of AMP must include protection of the private and profit-making enterprise being carried on at Freuling's World, and that such private concerns are not the business of public government. As former chairman of the board, John Harrison was asked to comment on the position taken by Mr. Ramsbotham. Mr. Harrison stated that he disagreed with the particular stand taken by Mr. Ramsbotham in this matter, but sympathized with his strong feelings of duty towards the shareholders of the concern. Confederation response was reported to be immediate and strong by sources high in the government 
but as yet no final word has been received regarding what action, if any, is contemplated. 2. Frederick Ramsbotham From John Harrison Subject, The Daily Paper Now you've torn it. Unless you think we can make money selling weapons to be used against our own people on Froiling's world. I've sold out my shares as of this morning, Fred. I'm through. I think you are, too, whether you know it or not just yet. End of chapter 11《Chapter Twelve of Slave Planet by Lawrence M. Jennifer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. That old time religion. Dodd heard the words echoing in his mind that night, and the next night, and the next. All that she had said. We set up a nice pie in the sky sort of thing, all according to the best theory. Just the thing to keep the Alberts happy and satisfied and working hard for us. It started right after the first setup here. And by now, I guess the Alberts think they invented it all by themselves. Or their great elder came down from a tree and told them. It's horrible, he had said. Of course it is. There was a silence. But you said it yourself. What can we do? We're here, and we're stuck here. But Norma didn't want to argue. But the argument went on in Dodd's mind, and it still continued, circling in his mind like a buzzard. There was nothing he could do about it, nothing Norma could do about it. He avoided even the thought of seeing her for a few days, and then he found himself making an excuse to go over to Building One. He met her there after lounging about for hours, and what she had disclosed to him, what they spoke of, made no difference that he could see in what he felt. He was happy. Slowly he realized that he had hardly ever been happy before. He even forgot, for a time, about the rumors, the threat of Confederation troops that had hung over her words like a gray cloud. All he could think of was Norma and the terrible thing in which they were both bound up. He told himself grimly that it would never have bothered Albin, for instance. Albin would have had his fun with Norma, and that would have been that. But it bothered Johnny Dodd. He was still worrying over it, and in spite of himself finding happiness, when the escape came, and the end. End of chapter 12 Chapter 13 of Slave Planet by Lawrence M. Jennifer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. There's nothing to be done about it. Dr. Hanlingen delivered the words and sat down rigidly behind her desk. Norma nodded very slowly. I know that, she said. I started out, I started to do just what you wanted, to talk to him, draw him out, find out just what he did feel and what he planned. And then something happened, Dr. Hanlingen said tightly. I know. Norma paced to the window and looked out, but the day was gray. She saw only her own reflection. Something happened, she murmured. I guess I had too much to drink. I wanted to talk. So I understand, Dr. Hanergen said. And you talked. And whatever his situation, you managed to increase his tension rather than understand or lessen it. Norma shook her head at the reflection. I'm sorry. I have often found, Dr. Hanlingen said, that sorrow following an action is worse than useless. It usually implies a request to commit the same action again. But I wouldn't, Norma said, turning, and then stopped before the calm gaze of the old woman. No, Dr. Hanlingen said. I'll try to... Dr. Hanlingen lifted a hand and brushed the words aside. It doesn't matter, she said. I am beginning to see that it doesn't matter. But all we can do now is wait, Dr. Hanlingen said. We are outplayed. There was a little silence. Norma waded through it without moving. Would you like to have a lesson in psychology? Dr. Hanlingen said in the graying room. 
Would you like to learn a little, just a little, about your fellow man? Norma felt suddenly frightened. What's wrong? Nothing is wrong, Dr. Hanlogen said. Everything is moving along exactly as it might have been predicted. If we had known what the Confederation planned, and exactly the timetable of their actions... But we did not, and could not. Norma, listen to me. The story she told was very simple. It took a fairly long time to tell. Slavery takes a toll of the slaves. As the Confederation was beginning to find out, as the idealists, the do-gooders, were beginning, however slowly, to realize. But it takes a toll of the masters, too. The masters can't quite rid themselves of the idea that beings which react so much like people may really, in spite of everything, in spite of appearance, in spite of laws and regulations and social practices, be people after all, in everything but name and training. And it just wouldn't be right to treat people that way. Slaves feel pain. In simple reciprocity, masters feel guilt. And because, according to the society and the laws and the appearances and the regulations, there was no need for guilt. The masters of Freuling's world had, like masters anywhere and any time, buried the guilt, hidden it even from themselves, forbidden its existence and forgotten to mention it to their thoughts. But the guilt remained, and the guilt demanded. Punishment was needed. They're going to fight. Dr. Hanlogen said. When the Confederation attacks, they're going to fight back. It's senseless. Even if we won, the Confederation fleet could blockade us, prevent us getting a shipment out, bottle us up and starve us for good. But they don't need sense. They need motive, which is quite a different thing. They're going to fight both because they need the punishment of a really good licking and because fighting is one more way for them to deny their guilt. It seems complex, Norma said. Everything is complex, Dr. Hanlogen said, as soon as human beings engage in it. The action is simple enough. Warfare. We've got to stop them. Dr. Hanlogen went on as if she hadn't heard. The actions serve two different, indeed two contradictory purposes. If you think that's something rare in the actions of mankind, you must be more naive than you have any right to be. We've got to stop them, Norma said again. Got to. They'll die. We'll all die. There is nothing to do, Dr. Hanlogen said. We are outplayed by the Confederation, by our own selves. We are outplayed. There are no moves left. There is nothing I can offer, nothing anyone can offer, quite as attractive as the double gift of punishment and denial. Shockingly, for the first time, the old woman sounded tired. Her voice was thin in the gray room. Nothing we can do, Norma. You're dismissed. Go back to work. But you can't just give up. You can show them there aren't any real reasons. Show them they're not being rational. Oh, but they'll be rational, Dr. Hanlogen said in the same still voice. Wait for the rumors to start, Norma. Wait for them to begin telling each other that the Confederation is going to kill them all anyhow. Take them back and hang them as war criminals. That's ridiculous. Perhaps. Then, rumors during a war are almost always ridiculous. That fact makes no difference at all. They'll be believed because they have to be believed. Norma thought, We can start counter-rumors, which would not be believed. They offer nothing, nothing that these people want. Oh, yes, people can be changed. Dr. Hanlogen paused. Given sufficient time and sufficient equipment, it is possible to make anyone into anything, anything at all. But to change these people, to make them act as we want, the time required is more than ten years, Norma, and we haven't got ten years. We've got to try, Norma said earnestly. What we have got, Dr. Hanlogen said, is more like ten days. 
and there is nothing to do in ten days. The people have spoken. Vox populi. The eyes closed. There was a silence. Norma waited, astonished, horrified. Perhaps it is necessary, Dr. Hanligen's voice said. Perhaps we must wait. It can nicht anders. What? Norma asked. Martin Luther, Dr. Hanligen's voice said, remote and thin. It means I can do nothing else. He wrote it as his justification for a course of action that was going to get him excommunicated, perhaps killed. But Dr. Hanligen said nothing, did nothing. The body sat behind its desk in the gray room. Norma stared, then turned and fled. End of chapter 13《 Chapter Fourteen of Slave Planet by Lawrence M. Janifer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The mixture of feelings inside Cadnan was entirely new to him, and he couldn't control it very well. He found himself shaking without meaning to, and was unable to stop himself. There was relief, first of all, that it was all over that he no longer had to worry about what Marver might have planned, or whether Marver were going to involve him. There was fright. Seeing anyone carry through such a foolhardy, almost impious idea in the teeth of the masters. And there was simple disappointment. The disappointment of a novice theologue who has seen his pet heretic slip the net and go free. For Cadnan had tried earnestly night after night, to convert Marver to the new truths the elders had shown him. They were luminously obvious to Cadnan, and they set the world in beautiful order. But somehow he couldn't get through to Marver at all, couldn't express the ideas he had well enough or convincingly enough to let Marver see how beautiful and true all of them really were. For a time, in fact, he told himself with bitterness that Marver's escape had really been all his own fault. If he'd only had more talks with Marver, he thought cloudily, or if he'd only been able to speak more convincingly. But regret is part of a subjunctive vocabulary. At least one writer has noted that the subjunctive is the mark of civilization. This may be true. It seems true. In Cadnet's case, at any rate, it certainly was true. Uncivilized, he spent little time in subjunctive moods. All that he had done, all that Marver had done, was open to him, and he remembered it often, but once the bad first minutes were past, he remembered everything with less and less regret. The mixture, as it stood, was heady enough for Cadman's untrained emotions. He had tried to talk to Marver about the truths, of course. Marver, though, had been obstinately indifferent. Nothing made any impression on his hardened, stubborn mind. And now he was gone. Dara had the news first. She came into their common room at the end of the day very excited, her hands still moving as if she were turning handles in the refinery, even after the close of work. Cadnan, still feeling an attraction for her, and perceiving now that something had disturbed her, stayed where he was squatting. Attraction for Dara, and help given to her, might lead to mating, and mating was against the rule. But Dara came to him. "'Do you know what happens with Marver?' she said. Her voice, always quiet, was still as sweet to Cadnan as it had ever been. "'He is gone, and the masters do not know where.' The mixture of emotions began. Surprise and relief first, then regret and disappointment, then fear, all boiling and bubbling inside him like a witch's stew. He spoke without thinking. He has gone to break the chain of obedience. He has gone to find others who think as he thinks. He is escaped, Dara said. It is the word the masters use when they speak of this. It happens before now, Cadnan told her. There are others whom he joins. Dara shut her eye. It is true, but I know what happens when there is an escape. In the place where my work is, there is one from Great Bend Tree. She tells me of what happens. 
Dara fell silent, and Cadnan watched her nervously. But he had no chance to speak. She began again, convulsively. When this other escapes, it is from a room of great bent tree. Cadnan nodded. He and Dara were of bent line tree, and hence in a different room. The segregation, simple for the masters, was handy and unimportant, and so it was used. Cadnan thought it natural. Every tree had its own room. Do they find the one who escapes? he asked. They find him. The masters come in, and they punish the others from the room. Precedent was clearly recognizable, even though it made no sense. Those who had not escaped surely had no reason to be punished, Cadnan thought. But what the masters had done to Great Bend Tree, they would do to Bent Line Tree. Everyone would be punished. With a shock, he realized that everyone included Dara. He heard himself speak. You must go. Dara looked at him innocently. Go? she said. You must go as Marver has gone. The masters do not take you for punishment if you go. There is nothing for me to do, she said, and her eye closed. No, I wait for you, but only to tell you this. There is nothing I can do. Marver is gone, Cadnan said slowly. You too can go. Maybe the masters do not find you. If you stay, you are punished. If you go, and they do not find you, there is no punishment for you. It amazed him that she could not see so clear a point. Then all can go, she said. All can escape punishment. Cadnan grunted, thinking that over. Where one goes, he said at last, one can go. Maybe many cannot go. Her answer was swift. And you? I stay here, he said, trying to sound as decisive as possible. Dara turned away. I do not listen to your words, she said flatly. I do not hear you or see you. Cadnan hissed in anguish. She had to understand. Shh! What do I say that is wrong? You must... You speak of my going alone, she said. But that is me and no more. What of the others? Marver, Cadnan said after a second. He is to come and aid them. He tells me this. We join him and come back with him, away from here, to where he stays now. Then none of us are punished. He paused. It will be a great punishment. I know, Dara said. Yet one does not go alone. Her voice was so low that Cadnan could barely hear it. But the words were like sharp stones, stabbing fear into his body. For the first time, he saw clearly exactly what she was driving at. And after a long pause, she spoke again. Where one goes, two may go. Where Marver goes, two may follow. One to lead the other. One goes alone, Cadden said, feeling himself tremble and trying to control it. You must go. It seemed a long time before she spoke again, and Cadnan held himself tightly until his muscles began to ache. We go together, she said at last. Two go where one has gone. Only so do I leave at all. It was an ultimatum, and Cadnan understood what was behind it. But an attraction between Dara and himself? He said, There is the rule of the tree but it was like casting water on steel. If we leave here, Dara said, why think of a smaller rule? Cadnan tried to find words, but there were no words. She had won, and he knew it. He could not let Dara stay behind to draw a great punishment, possibly even to die, to be no more Dara, and there was no way of forcing her to go and escape that fate. No way except to go with her. We must wait until they sleep, Dara said in a sudden return to practicality. Then we go. Cadnan looked around at the huddled, vaguely stirring forms of his companions. Fear was joined by a sort of sickness he had never known before. He was a slave, and that was good. But once outside, where would he find work, or food, or a master? Where there was no master, Cadnan told himself, 
There was no slave. He was nothing. Nameless. Non-existent. But there was neither word nor action for him now. He tried once more to argue, but his words were parried with a calm tenacity that left no room for discussion. In the end, he was ready to do what he had to do. Had to do, in order, simply, to save Dara. There was no other reason. He needed none. He had heard of the attraction of male for female, though some did not experience it until the true time of mating. He had not, until that moment, known how strong the attraction could be. The waiting, though it seemed like positive days, didn't take long. The others in the room fell asleep, by habit, one by one, and soon Dara and Cadnan were the only ones left awake. Neither was tempted to sleep. Their own terror and their decision kept them very effectively alert. Cadnan said, If the masters see us... Dara turned on him a face that seemed completely calm. They do not see us, she said flatly. Now do not speak. They rose and silently went to the door. The door opened just as quietly and shut once again behind them. The corridor was filled with watching eyes, Cadnan felt, but there were no masters in evidence. They stood for a second, waiting, and then Dara started down toward the big room at the end, her feet silent on the floor, and Cadnan followed her. No masters were visible. There should have been guards, but the guards might have been anywhere. One escape had hardly served to alert a lazy, uninterested group who performed their duties out of no more than habit. Wherever the guards were resting, they were not in the corridor. Everything went smoothly. It was smoother than Cadnan was willing to believe. Soon, though, they were actually in the great lobby of the building. It, too, was dark and empty. They stood dwarfed by the place the gigantic doors that led to freedom no more than a few feet away. Cadden kept telling himself that where Marver had gone, he too could go. But Marver had had a plan, and Cadden had none. Yet they were safe, so far, so far. They walked toward the door now, a step at a time. Each step seemed to take an hour, a full day. Dara walked ahead, straight and tall. Cadnan caught up with her, and she put out her hand. There was no more than an instant of hesitation. He took the hand. That pledged them to each other until the time of mating. But what was one more law now? Another step, another. Cadnan, in the silence, was suddenly tempted to make a noise, any sort of noise. But it seemed impossible to create sound. The quiet dimness wrapped him like a blanket. He took another step. Mating, he thought. If the chain of obedience was broken, would the trees refuse to obey in their turn? Puna had said so, and it was true. And if the trees refused to obey, there would be no mating. Yet Dara would be safe. That was the important thing. One thing at a time. Another step, and then at last, the door. Cadnan pushed at it, and it opened. And then there was sound, plenty of sound, more sound than he could have imagined, sound to fill the great lobby, to fill the entire building with rocking, trembling agonies of noise. There was an alarm bell, to be exact, an alarm buzzer, combinations and solo cadenzas. The guards were, after all, no more than dressing. The automatic machinery never slept, and it responded beautifully and with enthusiasm. Cadnan and Dara ran crazily out into the darkness. The building fell behind them, and the jungle was ahead. Still they ran, but Cadnan felt the ground, bumpy instead of smooth, and stumbled once, nearly falling. He saw Dara ahead of him. Getting up and beginning again was automatic. Panic beat at him. The noise grew and grew. His feet moved, his heart thudded, and then the lights went on. Automatic sweep searchlights were keyed in. The machinery continued to respond. Cadnan found himself suddenly struck blind. Ahead of him, Dara made a single, lonely, terrified sound that overrode all the alarms. 
Cadnan tried to shout, We must run! In the dark the masters cannot see! But of course, by then it was too late to move. The masters were all around them. The escape was over. End of chapter 14「Chapter Fifteen of Slave Planet by Lawrence M. Jennifer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Of course, there was Norma, Dodd told himself. There was Norma to make everything worthwhile, except that Norma needed something too, and he couldn't provide it. No one could provide it, not as long as no one was allowed off planet. And it was quite certain, Dodd told himself gloomily, that the restrictions that had been in force yesterday were going to look like freedom and carefree joy compared with the ones going into effect tomorrow or next week. If, of course, there was going to be a tomorrow. That, he thought, was always in doubt. He managed sometimes to find a sort of illusory peace in thinking of himself as dead, scattered into component atoms finished, forever unconscious, no longer wanting anything, no longer seeing the blinking words in his mind. Somewhere in his brain a small germ stirred redly against the prospect, but he tried to ignore it. That was no more than brute self-preservation, incapable of reasoning. That was no more than human nature. And human nature, he knew with terror, was about to be overthrown once more. It was only human, after all, to find the cheapest way to do necessary work. It was only human to want the profits high and the costs low. It was only human to look on other races as congenitally inferior, as less than man in any possible sense, as materials, in fact, to be used. That was certainly human. Centuries of bloody experience proved it. But the Confederation didn't want to recognize human nature. The Confederation didn't like slavery. The rumor he'd heard from Norma was barely rumor any more. Instead, it had become the next thing to an officially announced fact. Everyone knew it, even if next to no one spoke of it. The Confederation was going to send ships. Had probably sent ships already. There was going to be a war. The very word war roused that red spark of self-preservation. It was harder, Dodd had found, to live with hope than to live without it. It was always possible to become resigned to a given state of affairs. But not if he kept thinking matters would improve. So he stamped on the spark, kept it down, ignored it. You had to accept things and go on from there. It was too bad Norma didn't know that. He tried to tell her, of course. They'd even been talking, over in Building One, on the very night of the near escape. He'd explained it all very clearly and lucidly, without passion. Since he had cut himself off from hope, he found he had very few passions of any kind left, and that made it easy. But she hadn't been convinced. "'As long as there is a fighting chance to live, I want to live,' she'd said. As long as there's any chance at all, the same as you. I know what I want, he told her grimly. What? she asked and smiled. Do you like what you're doing? Do you like what I'm doing? What the whole arrangement is here? He shrugged. You know I don't. Then get out of it, she said, still smiling. All you have to do is stop living. Just like that, no more trouble. Don't be sil- It can be done, she went on flatly. There are hundreds of ways. Then the smile again. But you'd rather live, Johnny. You'd rather live even this way, being a slaver, than put an end to it and to yourself. He paused. It's not the same thing. No, she said. This way you'd have to do the killing yourself. When the ships come... You can let them do it for you. Just sit and wait for someone to kill you, like a cataleptic. But you won't, Johnny. I will, he said. She shook her head, the smile remaining. 
Her voice was quiet and calm, but there was a feeling of strain in it. There was strain everywhere now. Everyone looked at the sky and saw nothing. Everyone listened for the sound of engines, and there were no engines to hear. Catalepsy is a kind of death, Johnny, and you'll have to inflict that much on yourself. You won't do it. You think I... He stopped and swallowed. You think I like living this way, don't you? I think you like living, Norma said. I think we all do, no matter how rough it gets. No matter how it grates on the nerves, or the flesh, or the supersensitive conscience. And I know how you feel, Johnny. I do. I... She stopped very suddenly. He heard his voice say, I love you. There was a silence. Johnny she said, and her hands reached out for him blindly. He saw, incredibly, tears like jewels at the corners of her eyes. Johnny! It was at that moment that the alarm bell rang. It was heard only faintly in Building One, but that didn't matter. Dodd knew the direction and the sound. He turned to go, for a second, no more than a machine. Norma's voice said, Escape? He came back to her. I... The alarm tripped off. This time they must have tried it through the front door or a window. The last one must have tunneled through. He had to leave her. Instead, he stood silently for a second. She said nothing. There are spots the steel's never covered, he said. You can tunnel through if you're lucky. A pause. I... It's all right, Johnny, she said. Norma, it's all right. I understand. It's all right. Her voice. He hung on to it as he turned and walked away. Found the elevator. Started away from the room. The building where she was. Started off to do his duty. His duty as a slaver. The night was long. So long, it could have been the night before the end of the world the universe drawing one last deep breath before blowing out the candles and returning at last to peace and darkness and silence. Dodd spent it posted as one of the guards around the two cells where the Alberts were penned. He had plenty of time to think. And in spite of Norma, in spite of everything, he was still sure of one thing. Because he was a slaver, because he acted still as a slaver and a master, hated by the Confederation, hated by the Alberts, hated by that small part of himself which had somehow stayed clean of the foulness of his work and his life, because of all that, it was going to be very easy to die. Public Opinion 4 Being an excerpt from a directive issued by the Executive and his private counsel elected and confirmed by the Confederation, and upheld by majority vote of the Senate. The directive preserved in Confederation archives and signed under date of May 21st in the year 210 of the Confederation. It is therefore directed that sufficient ships be fitted out with all modern armaments, said fitting to be in the best judgment of the competent and assigned authorities, and dispatched without delay toward the planet known as Froiling's World, both to subdue any armed resistance to Confederation policy and to affirm the status of Froiling's World as a protectorate of the Confederation, subject to Confederation policy and Confederation judgment. An act of this nature cannot be undertaken without grave thought and consideration. We affirm that such consideration has been given to this step. It is needless to have fear as to the outcome of this action. No isolated world can stand against not only the might but the moral judgment of the Confederation. Arms can be used only as a last resort, but times will come in the history of peoples when they must be so used, when no other argument is sufficient to force one party to cease and desist from immoral and unbearable practices. In accordance with the laws of the Confederation, no weapons shall be used which destroy planetary mass. 
In general, our efforts are directed towards as little bloodshed as possible. Our aim is to free the unfortunate native beings of Freuling's world, and then to begin a campaign of re-education. The fate of the human beings who have enslaved these natives shall be left to the Confederation courts, which are competent to deal in such matters by statute, of the year 47 of the Confederation. We pledge that we shall not interfere with such dealings by the courts. We may further reassure the peoples of the Confederation that no further special efforts on their part will be called for. This is not to be thought of as a war or even as a campaign, but merely as one isolated, regretted, but necessary blow at a system which cannot but be a shock to the mind of civilized man. That blow must be delivered, as we have been advised by our counselors. It shall be delivered. The ships, leaving as directed, will approach Froiling's world leaving the FTL embodiments and re-entering the world line within ten days. Full reports will be available within one month. In giving this directive, we have been mindful of the future status of any alien beings on worlds yet to be discovered. We hereby determine, for ourselves and our successors, that nowhere within reach of the Confederation may slavery exist under any circumstances. The heritage of freedom which we have protected, and which belongs to all peoples, must be shared by all peoples, everywhere, and to that end we direct our actions and our prayers. Given under date of May 21st, in the year 210 of the Confederation, to be distributed and published everywhere within the Confederation, under our hand and seal. Richard Germont by grace of God, executive of the Confederation, together with his council in judgment assembled, all members subscribing thereto. End of chapter 15。Chapter 16 of Slave Planet by Lawrence M. Jennifer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The room had no windows. There was an air-conditioning duct, but Cadden did not know what such a thing was, nor would he have understood without lengthy and tiresome explanations. He didn't know he needed air to live. He knew only that the room was dark and that he was alone, boxed in, frightened. He guessed that somewhere, in another such room, Dara was waiting, just as frightened as he was, and that guess made him feel worse. Somehow, he told himself, he would have to escape. Somehow he would have to get to Dara and save her from the punishment, so that she did not feel pain. It was wrong for Dara to feel pain. But there was no way of escape. He had crept along the walls, pushing with his whole body, in hopes of some opening. But the walls were metal, and he could not push through metal. He could, in fact, do nothing at all except sit and wait for the punishment he knew was coming. He was sure now that it would be the great punishment, that he and Dara would be dead and no more. And perhaps, for his disobedience, he deserved death. But Dara could not die. He heard himself say her name, but his voice sounded strange and he barely recognized it. It seemed to be blotted up by the darkness, and after that, for a long time, he said nothing at all. He thought suddenly of old Gornum and of Puna. They had said there was an obedience in all things. The slaves obeyed, the masters obeyed, and the trees obeyed. And possibly the chain of obedience, if not already broken by Marver's escape and what he and Dara had tried to do, extended also to the walls of his dark room. For a long time he considered what that might mean. If the walls obeyed, he might be able to tell them to go. They would move, and he could leave and find Dara. Since it would not be for himself but for Dara, such a command might not count as an escape. The chain of obedience might work for him. This complicated chain of reasoning occupied him for an agonized time before he finally determined to put it to the test. But when he did, the walls did not move. The door, 
which he tried as soon as it occurred to him to do so, didn't move either. With the land of terror, he told himself that the chain of obedience had been broken. The thought was too terrible for him to contemplate for long, and he began to change it little by little in his mind. Perhaps, for instance, the chain was only broken for him and for Marver. Perhaps it still worked as well as ever for all those who still obeyed the rules. That was better. It kept the world whole and sane and reasonable. But along with it came the picture of Gornum watching small Cadnan sadly. Cadnan felt a weight press down on him and grow and grow. He tried the walls and the door again, almost mechanically. He felt his way around the room. There was nothing he could do. But that idea would not stay in his mind. There had to be something, and he had to find it. In a few seconds, he told himself he would find it. He tried the walls again. He was beginning to shiver. In a few seconds, only a few seconds, he would find a way. And then... The door opened, and he whirled and stared at it. The sudden light hurt his eye, but he closed it for no more than a second. As soon as he could, he opened it again, and stood, too unsure of himself to move, watching the master framed in the doorway. It was the one who was called Dodd. Dodd stared back for what seemed a long time. Cadnan said nothing, waiting and wondering. "'It's all right,' the master said at last. "'You don't have to be afraid, Cadnan. I'm not going to hurt you.' He looked sadly at the slave, but Cadnan ignored the look. There was no room in him for more guilt. "'I am not afraid,' he said. He thought of going past Dodd to find Dara, but perhaps Dodd had come to bring him to her. Perhaps Dodd knew where she was. He questioned the master with Dara's name. "'The female?' Dodd asked. "'She's all right. She's in another room, just like this one. A solitary room.' Cadnan shook his head. "'She must not stay there.' "'You don't have to worry,' Dodd said. Nobody's doing anything to her. Not right now, anyhow. I... Not right now. She must escape, Cadnan said, and Dodd's sadness appeared to grow. He pushed at the air as if he were trying to move it all away. She can't. His hands fell to his sides. Neither can you, Cadnan. I'm... Look, there's a guard stationed right down the corridor, watching this door every second I'm here. There are electronic networks in the door itself, so that if you manage somehow to open it, there'll be an alarm. He paused and began again, more slowly. If you go past me, or if you get the door open, the noise will start again. You won't get fifteen feet. Cadnan understood some of the speech, and ignored the rest. It wasn't important. Only one thing was important. She cannot die. Dodd shook his head. I'm sorry, he said flatly. There's nothing I can do. A silence fell, and after a time he broke it. Cadnan, you've really messed things up. I know you're right. Anybody knows it. Slavery... Slavery is... Well, look, whatever it is, the trouble is it's necessary. Here and now. Without you, without your people, we couldn't last on this world. We need you, Cadnan, whether it's right or not, and that has to come first. Cadnan frowned. I do not understand, he said. Doesn't matter, Dodd told him. I can understand how you feel. We've treated you pretty badly, I guess. Pretty badly. He looked away with what seemed nervousness. But there was nothing to see outside the door, nothing but the corridor light that spilled in and framed him. Oh, Cadnan said earnestly, still puzzled. Masters are good, it is true. Masters are always good. You don't have to be afraid of me, Dodd said, still looking away. Nothing I could do could hurt you, even if I wanted to hurt you. And I don't, Cadnan. You know I don't. I am not afraid, Cadnan said. I speak the truth, no more. Masters are good. It is a great truth. Dodd turned to face him. But you tried to escape. Cadnan nodded. Dara cannot die, he said in a reasonable tone. She would not go without me. Die? 
Dodd asked, and then, Oh, I see. The other... There was a long silence. Cadnan watched Dodd calmly. Dodd had turned again to stare out into the hallway, his hands nervously moving at his sides. Cadnan thought again of going past him, but then Dodd turned and spoke, his head low. I've got to tell you, he said. I came here, I don't know why, but maybe I just came to tell you what's happening. Cadnan nodded. Tell me, he said very calmly. Dodd said, I, and then stopped. He reached for the door, held it for a second without closing it, and then briefly shook his head. You're going to die, he said in an even, almost inhuman tone. You're both going to die, for trying to escape. And the whole of your clan or family or whatever that is, they're going to die with you, all of them. It was coming out in a single rush. Dodd's eyes fluttered closed. It's my fault. It's our fault. We did it. We... And the rush stopped. Cadnan waited for a second, but there was no more. Dara is not to die, he said. Dodd sighed heavily, his eyes still closed. I'm sorry, he said slowly. It's a silly thing to say, I'm sorry. I wish there was something I could do. He paused. But there isn't. I wish... Never mind. It doesn't matter. But you understand, don't you? You understand? Cadnan had room for only one thought, the most daring of his entire life. You must get Dara away. I can't, Dodd said, unmoving. Cadnan peered at him, half fearfully. You are a master. One did not give orders to masters or argue with them. But Dodd did not reach for punishment. I can't, he said again. If I help Dara, it's the jungle for me, or worse. And I can't live there. I need what's here. It's a matter of... a matter of necessity. Understand? His eyes opened, bright and blind. It's a matter of necessity, he said. It has to be that way. And that's all. Cadnan stared at him for a long second. He thought of Dara, thought of the punishment to come. The master had said there was nothing to do, but that thought was insupportable. There had to be something. There had to be a way. There was a way. Shouting, Dara! He found himself in the corridor, somehow having pushed past Dodd. He stood, turning, and saw another master with a punishment tube. Everything was still. There was no time for anything to move in. He never knew if the tube had done it, or if Dodd had hit him from behind. Very suddenly, he knew nothing at all, and the world was blank, black, and distant. If time passed, he knew nothing about it. When he woke again, he was alone again. He was back in the dark and solitary room. End of chapter 16